How many of you in here are developers or technical? Yeah. And how many of you want to hear a technical presentation? This is not a technical presentation. Uh, when I asked this question about enterprise data world a month ago, I had three people who wanted to hear this presentation, and everybody else wanted to hear a technical one. So I switched and changed. Um, and, oh, my mic. Is that better? Oh, there we go. So this is, the ten, this is a presentation about persuading people to understand benefits of Mark Logic, um, and it's not technical on how to do something in Mark Logic. So is that okay, or do you want me to switch? Is that good? Good? We're good? All right, let's do it. All right, good. Well, I, I'm just worried after that last conference, I totally switched, and it was, it was great. But it, anyway, I'm a, um, I'm a principal engineer at the LDS Church. I'm an architect for everything database, BI, data governance, um, data warehousing, master data management, and all the databases. And we use Oracle, SQL Server, and MarkLogic databases. We also have other databases like Cassandra, and um, you name it, we have little pockets of everything. But I wrote this book years ago, there's two editions of it, and that has nothing to do with databases, as you can see. And, but it actually, my background is in XML, and I've written XML interpreters, XML compilers, XML languages, um, and I'm very much into the web. And so this book was actually my attempt to figure out CSS, which I thought would be easy, and it wasn't, so I wrote a book. So um, this is, if you wanna know how to, CSS really works in browsers, and you understand the design patterns, the technical, detailed, hardcore design patterns that are built in to HTML and CSS, this book has that in there. Um, the church has 15 million members, we're all over the world where we're, we do humanitarian assistance in 185 countries. We have thousands of documents in 188 published languages. So it's not just thousands, it's more like you know, hundreds of thousands of documents. Um, we have 192 websites, give or take, it's always changing, um, and applications in production, and with billions of page hits. Um, so we have a large IT shop with many hundreds of developers. Um, building all kinds of applications. If you look at my LinkedIn page, you'd see that people rank me number one for being an Oracle person. Um, so, and here I am at MarkLogic. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of funny to me. I am a big MarkLogic fan, and we're gonna talk about how to turn from this as an Oracle person into a happy, smiling MarkLogic person. But this was me eight years ago. I was at Oracle Open World, and um, I, was, I was having a great time drinking the Oracle Kool-Aid and learning all about, because I was hired at, at nine years ago at the church to be an Oracle architect. And so that's, that was my whole career path and I was just loving it. And my boss called me up and he says, Mike, we have this weird database that this guy wants to bring in called MarkLogic. It's an XML database. Oracle has an XML database built into it. We don't want to pay any more license costs. We have an, uh, we have an enterprise license, an unlimited enterprise license of Oracle. So why would we buy anything else? So he says, go and kill MarkLogic. <laughs> and so I said, great, I love it, I'm all on board. So I came back and I spent the next two months trying to kill Mark Logic. Um, in fact, Keith Reinhold, who's over here, works with me, he, he, was the, well, he was one of the team that was actively promoting Mark Logic, and I was on the opposite side. So we argued for months over Christmas. My wife told, banned me from email over Christmas. So I kept on arguing against Mark Logic. Finally, Keith kept saying to me the whole time, will you just install Mark Logic and try it? So I, I spent two months trying to get Oracle XMLDB to work. I worked with Mark Drake, who is the product manager for Oracle XMLDB. And we worked a month, every, every other day or so, we were on the phone for hours trying to make it work. In the end, I solved Mark Logic two hours, loaded all the documents, loaded my queries. It worked, it was fast, it was easy. Two months, two hours. Um, that was my introduction to Mark Logic. Then I went to my boss, who is an Oracle guy, and I learned the hard way of how to convince an internal organization um, to use something strange and weird that is unproven in the industry. And so, again, I got that look when my boss says, you're nuts. And then, um, I, but then I learned how to persuade, and this is the whole story today, is about how to persuade people who don't understand new technologies to accept something very strange. Today, we've been very successful with MarkLogic. We have as many MarkLogic servers as we do Oracle servers. Wow. So, eight years later, yeah. So it's been a great, 
So anyway, no, every organization needs, the first thing is you need a champion. I became the champion of, of NoSQL. Um, and if you see NoSQL on the slide, it means Mark Logic in this case, in the organization. It was very painful. I had to, we had debates all the time throughout the organization with developers, and they fought me left and right on everything you can imagine. I talked about how xQuery is a functional language and how awesome that is, and they go, that's stupid. We don't do functional. Um, I talk about Mark Logic's an app server, and it's a database, and it's a search engine all in one. Well, that's stupid. We have databases and search engines and app servers. Why are we combining them here with a strange, dumb language called xQuery with this not popular, and I'm, I do Java. And so we, had, we even had people going, I, we are, we're the app server team. MarkLogic should be on our team. At one point, the MarkLogic moved from the database team to the app server team. Um, it's moved the web teams. It's moved the content team in publishing. It's moved all over the place. Finally, it's landed for the last five years um, back in our enterprise information management database team. Um, all the time I've been, I've been involved with as an architect for MarkLogic, but it's moved around because it's, it's a lot of things and people don't know how to classify it. So you need a champion to handle this. Um, the, I think the reason why MarkLogic's been successful in the church is that it works, but, but I had to do lots of training. I had a champion. I had to fight when it was, at one point, they got up to upper management and they wanted to kill it like crazy. I even had one, I had our director of engineering over all developers come to me and he goes, Mike, we don't need MarkLogic. We can just build this. We have blue scene. You know, we can just take the open source stuff and we can build our own. And I had to explain all the things that was in MarkLogic that you'd have to build. You know, so we had, I brought this whole thing up to, to upper management and they were trying to kill it and I had to argue with upper management for, for months. Finally got approved. So this is, you need to be influential if you're the champion. You need to convince the developers, convince upper management, and you have to be really tough skinned because it is tough. I'm not kidding. I have, I have, if I took out my, no, anyway, there's like stripes across the back. No, it's not. But it's, it's tough. Um, so this is the picture. You'll see a theme here. I took pictures at Yellowstone, and that reminds me of one of my bosses. I don't know why, but I think it's, it's the look of like, what? Are you serious? I'm going to tear you up. What are you talking about? So you got to get management to buy into this thing. If you're an enterprise like we are, we're large, um, we're the equivalent of like a, I don't know, a very large fortune something company, uh, international company, the size of a, if you want to compare it to a government, because we are a nonprofit, but like the size of Switzerland. I think that would be the size of what we are. So we're an enterprise, and upper management likes enterprise databases. So that wasn't a hard sell for us. Um, but if you're a startup, um, they don't like that. They like open source databases. And one of our, we're, we're lots of, we're huge. And so we have one gro whole group, a whole department that's on our, it's our family search. You might have heard of it. It's our genealogy. And if you go to familysearch.org, you can go and get, do your own family tree for free. Um, it's really awesome. So that group, though, is independent of my group, and they are open source. So we've tried to get them to look at MarkLogic for years, and they won't touch it because they're open source. And it's a, it's a, a religious thing for them. Uh, <laughs> We're very passionate about religion, obviously, and so they won't even touch it because they, uh, um, startups, they're like a startup. And I go to conferences all over the country, different NoSQL conferences, and those groups that are open source, they just won't consider. I, in fact, I go to these presentations. I went eBay at EDW a month ago, did a presentation. They're talking about all these NoSQL databases. Of course, MarkLogic wasn't part of them because it's, they were talking open source stuff. One person asked the question in the audience, is there, an, is there an ACID compliant NoSQL database out there? Because you know, they were talking about Mongo and Cassandra and um, what was the other? Oh, um, starts with R. What's it? Redis. Redis. And um, they're all open source. They're not ACID compliant. They were talking about all these problems they were having and, um, and the good things too. There's positive pros and cons. And anyway, guys, and I said, no one's, he said, no. The guy, the guy talking said, there's no, no, there's no ACID compliant NoSQL databases. And I'm going, oh, man. So I raised my hand. And waited, and I said, "Yes, there is. It's called MarkLogic, and it's a document database. Um, but if you're open source, they kind of have the blinders on. So you you have to be aware of your groups and deal with them appropriately. Um, sometimes, like the family search groups, I I don't even debate with their architect anymore because they're just like they're gone. They're gone. They're, they're open. I just know talking to them. Um, lower management, though, that the cool thing is lower management is different. So middle management, um, the managers that manage your developers." My, my experience is that they want to make developers happy. They want their teams to be productive and happy. So if the team really likes the technology, they really tend to just go with what the team wants. 
I've watched that over and over in our organization. We'll have a group that's perfect for MarkLogic to do MarkLogic for building websites. Um, so XML, app server search, websites, those are like perfect combinations. And so some of those guys actually fight and say, the developers go, I don't want MarkLogic on my resume, so I want whatever it is, Node.js, and I want Mongo, or whatever the thing they want. And so then their teams, their manager says, okay, whatever makes you happy, I'll do it because I'll get productivity from you. And I watched teams switch from MarkLogic to something else, fail and go back to MarkLogic, try something else, fail and come back to MarkLogic over and over again because they're trying, the lower management wants to make their teams happy. So how do we solve this problem? We've got it as a champion, you've got to be able to interface with all these different groups, particularly inter the enterprises and the lower management. And you've got to get the developers wanting MarkLogic and getting them excited about it, and then they'll convince their managers from the bottom up, and you gotta convince the enterprises from the top down. If you can accomplish both as a champion, then your organization will accept MarkLogic really well. So when I, we first got MarkLogic, we did tons of training. I, would, I, would, I did, I don't know how many training sessions, I don't know, a dozen training sessions that lasted an entire week, and I trained them on XQuery and MarkLogic's capabilities, um, and we still do training. I just finished training with Mormon.org that lasted about six, six, eight hour days over couple of months spread out. And then I did a, our, our LDS.org is another website we have. And I did that team, which is about 50 person team. And I did, I started with four hour periods twice a week and then went down to two hours, had a hard time with their attention span. So we have to work on that with that group. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, we had, we did months and months of training for them. In fact, I stopped because I'm, I'm writing a book on a cookbook for MarkLogic and how to query and use MarkLogic as, an, as a database. Um, and so I wanted to refactor my book. So they would go on the rest of the year that way with training. So there's a lot of training you need to do to keep this going so you get the ground swell going up. And then you always, I'm meeting with upper management all the time about MarkLogic to make sure they're supporting it coming down. So that's really important. Another one, this is another picture of a squirrel. I got, and this reminds me of a developers because developers are like, wait a minute, <laughs> what are you talking about? And what is this NoSQL database thing? You know, and they're busy chewing on their Java or Node.js code, and they're going like, I don't know what that thing is. So you caught them off guard. I actually caught that squirrel off guard eating, and you stared me down like, what? Okay, so this is, I, when you talk about developers, I want to show the developers how that it can make them rock stars. NoSQL can really change how productive they are. That's real. That's not just anecdotal or some, you know, some guy like me spouting off stuff to try to impress you. It's true. We've been doing this for eight years. We have um, proven that MarkLogic makes developers two to 10 times faster than relational in Java. Um, so it's just true. So I, what I, that's what I tell them is that document databases have the fastest development times. Key value, which the difference between key value and document is key values just have a key and a blob. They, and you have to do a lot of more development work to, to compensate for lack of all those indexes. MarkLogic has indexes on everything. Key value has one index. Now they're, they're merging together, so some key values have secondary indexes, but you have to do a lot of coding to compensate. So you're not as fast at development because you're writing lots of code, but it's really fast because the, the database is kind of stupid. You just put a blob in with the key and give it a key and it gives you a blob back. I mean, it doesn't have to do much, so it's just a real simple technology, but it's really fast. Widecom, like Cassandra, has really built for internet scale, gig ginormous clusters. Um, it's built around that horrible to develop them because it takes you forever to model your data. For example, we have Cassandra, I know firsthand, and you, I, I've been to lots of Cassandra trainings, and the idea is you take every query you ever are going to ever write, and you create a table for it. I'm not kidding. This is the, you go to the website, you, you, every query you will ever do on your database has to have its own specialized table for that query. And you materialize every query. And then it'll be fast for queries. That's how you, that's how you build an app of Cassandra. That's exactly what we're doing in our major family search app. Our family search app runs on Cassandra. We spent three years building that app to do that very thing. Plus we had to build an engine on top. Well, Cassandra is an engine, it's not a database. So we had to build a layer on top to turn it into a database to handle transactions coming in, to get atomicity, isolation, and consistency. And we had to build our own database layer on top of Cassandra. Everybody who ever used Cassandra has to do that too. So a developer needs to understand that if they're going to wide column, they, never, they ought to be a senior or principal engineer first off to even handle the complexity. They're gonna to have to understand they're gonna build a whole database on top of this engine that they get. And they're gonna be writing code to take the data that comes in and turn them into multiple materialized tables so that they can query. And there's no joins at Cassandra, no joins. You're materializing every query. 
and key value, the developer has to go and embed all the IDs of foreign keys in their documents. So when they pull a blob back with a the key, they have to go inside the document, read those out, and go get those documents. Pull them back, read inside of them, go out and get more documents. So they're just constantly pulling in blobs, extracting the data, and then querying for more blobs. The database is just doing nothing but giving them back blobs when you give them keys. So you're doing a lot of extra coding work in the key value. And the document database, though, really has the productivity. So we built a true life story. We built an app two years ago. We started it. Um, the original, it was a rewrite of, a, of an older app. And the original app took five years to build, but I'll just say three years of constant development because two of those years were unproductive. So three years of constant development with three developers. Okay, so that was the original scope. We rewrote it with a completely different UI, a completely different data structure. It was a complete refactoring of the app. So it's not like we built on the original one. We completely redid the entire paradigm. So it's not like we could just stand on the shoulders of the old app. We completely threw the old one away and went from scratch with something entirely different um, to accomplish the same goals. And we wrote it in with two developers in one year, not three developers in three years. The original app was written in Java and Oracle. The new app was written entirely in MarkLogic and Node.js. So one year, two developers, Really, it was one developer because the other developer was just enhancing MarkLogic's API. This was before MarkLogic 8 had, came out, and we were doing what MarkLogic 8 before MarkLogic 8 did it. So now we could have just eliminated that developer. So really, today it would be one developer could write what took three developers three years and do it in one year. And that app, not only did we do it that much faster, that app has 10 times the capability. I'm not kidding. We take all the original app. You take a Word document, and you, fill, you turn it into a form, and you fill out this form, and it saves it internally in Oracle database um, like it used to be in the Word app. So it was our data sharing agreements. And it was just typing stuff in. So it was this basic app to just type in text and share and save it. Um, our new app, we go out and gather all the metadata of all databases in the church. We have hundreds of Oracle, SQL Server, and MarkLogic databases, and all web, ser all web services in the church. We gather all that metadata, we pull it into MarkLogic, we create data domains that are business driven, so we, and we map the metadata to the data domain that's business driven, and we share the data through the data domains. So we can say this column in this table in this schema in this database is being shared with this database over here. The original app, all you could do is say, is that some data called address is being shared from here to here. Now we can tell you exactly where that data is coming from. So this is an order of magnitude increased complexity. Now we can do the same thing with web services. MarkLogic made all of that possible in one year with two developers as opposed to three years, three developers, and something that was really pitiful when you look at it. So the, the productivity is very real. The other thing with Lesson 4 is to do tons of training. I mentioned that earlier, but data modeling is so different in NoSQL. Um, I had developers, when I would say, go build, it, go take MarkLogic and go build an app, they would go normalize their data and create, create documents, one document per table, and try to join them together, and it was a disaster. You have to think in MarkLogic to model is an entity is one document. So everything about a person is in that document. Now, if I'm writing relational, I'll say, um, there's lots of many to ones. And so I would say maybe there's a person row, and then I'd have another table for addresses, another table for phone numbers, another table for, you know, I don't have lots of tables. In MarkLogic, everything about a person is in the person document. Everything about an order is in the order document, right? So that is, you still have, you can still do some joins across the orders and the people, um, especially if you do server-side JavaScript or XQuery, you can do some shotgun joins to make that work well. And the next release of MarkLogic will have some even more join capabilities. But your, your modeling is really natural in MarkLogic. So you've got to train them to, to do it that way. MarkLogic sees the data differently than a relational database sees it. And what I mean by that is a relational database indexes everything with B trees, um, B tree indexes. MarkLogic indexes is using a search type of indexes, not just one index, lots of search indexes. And it's a different way of seeing the data. So you, once you learn to see the data as MarkLogic sees it, you can query it fast and effectively. So you need a, a lot of training on modeling, a lot of training on querying. Um, there's lots of best practices and anti-patterns. So I, I use this picture. This is at Yellowstone. And it's about you know, a bear training their cubs. Because we really have to, that champion needs to do lots of training. I found that when I first did MarkLogic and brought it in, we did tons of training. I was then pulled off for about two two or three years, I've lost track, I can't still go back, two or three years doing a financial, big financial application for the church, trying to rescue that project. It was our biggest project we've ever done, a multinational banking system. Um, 
Then I came back to MarkLogic after that. During that period when I was gone, I wasn't doing any training on MarkLogic. There was no MarkLogic champion left. Everybody just kind of went off on their own. We had a lot of fragmentation happening. And MarkLogic, after that, has started to decline because the training wasn't happening. So as recently, um, we brought back training, and I'm doing tons of training and reviving MarkLogic. That training is critical to keep the developers happy. And if you keep developers happy, their lower management or middle management right above them is happy. And then that gives you the energy to keep the Mark logic in the organization going. So there's another thing I want to talk about is a lot of us think that persuasion is one dimensional. It's really four dimensions. A lot of you have taken, how many of you have taken the, the those tests, those behavior personality style tests where you are different colors, right? Only, no, only a few of you dare raise your hand because like, oh no, oh, no. Well, there's one of my favorite ones labels them. These are the colors, blue, red, yellow, and green. But there's also labels that one group calls analyzers, controllers, persuaders, and stabilizers. Um, we did a lot of training on this, and I've been using this for the last six years with great effect. So you persuade people differently depending on what style they have. Now, no one is one dimensional. I am all four of these things, but my close, in fact, make that, see if you can guess. Read these, like, analyzers are thoughtful, slow, soft to speak, must be right all the time. Controllers are decisive, hard spoken, disagreeable, they must be in control. The persuaders are convincing, loud spoken, fun loving, and they must be liked. And the stabilizers are pleasing, slowly build consensus, and must be safe um, through having consensus. Everybody must agree. So now, look at these and tell me what kind of person I am. Just tell me, what do you think? Persuader, because right now, I'm absolutely a persuader. Now, notice my arms are out, I'm loud, I'm energetic, I'm excited. That's totally, I'm convincing, and I really want you to like me, right? <laughs> Are you ready? Right now, this role, I'm, I really do. But now, if I'm an analyzer, which is my true nature, believe it or not, <laughs> I know, it doesn't seem right, that, but we can switch around. We can be different things. We're not one-dimensional. I will be happy, literally, if you just put me in a room and put, slide pizza under the door, and don't talk to me for months, and let me code, right? And let me think and solve problems. That's my true nature. And I used to be a total introvert. <clears throat> I used to couldn't talk to people, scared of everybody. That's, that's really who I am. So I, I split back and forth between these. These are kind of opposites. Controllers and stabilizers are opposites, too. My wife's a stabilizer. Um, she likes consensus and likes everybody to be harmony, hates debate. Persuaders love to debate. I love to debate you anytime. I love this part. So part of me is definitely a persuader. But now, if you want to convince me, because my core is analyzer, you have to have facts. In fact, in a debate, I will debate facts. And if you gave me a new fact that I hadn't thought of, and that fact was the key to changing my mind, I might have changed like that. Because facts rule my brain. I actually, when you sit in a debate, even though I'm persuading you right now, or I'm acting as a persuader, I don't care about convincing arguments. When I go, if I'm sitting here, if I was sitting in the audience right now, I'd be thinking, what are the facts that Mike's saying? And I'd be evaluating the entire thing on facts. I don't care how influential Mike is, but some people really care about who are the influential people. My boss, um, when we brought Mark Logic in, is a persuader. And so he cared about who recommended Mark Logic. It was the who that was important to him. Not he's also he's he's less of an analyzer, and so he didn't care about the facts as much as he cared about the who. And he trusts, but he cares. He picks out a couple of people in the organization he trusts, and what they say he goes with. And so I was one of those people uh, somehow, and he trusted me, and I convinced him. And so he cared about the who. An analyzer compares about the what, the facts. The controller cares about prove it, show me, right. Show me. I'm from Missouri. I'm the show me state, right? So they care. I've heard that so many times from controllers. They tend to be CEOs and upper management. Often, they can be any of these, but a lot of ours have been controllers. And they just say, prove it. Make a POC. Show it in action. Make it fast. And get it done, and I'll believe you. I'll believe it when I see it. That's the controller. The stabilizer is, if everybody agrees, then I will agree. Like for example, my wife's a stabilizer. She can tell you who the next president of the United States will be once they get the candidates all finished up. So because... Um, <laughs> Because she will know the popular opinion. That's, she spends her entire time thinking about what is everybody else thinking. That's the last thing I think about. Uh, give me a book and I'll study the facts. That's what I care about. She's going to go study the people. And so that controllers think about it, or stabilizers just think about it very differently. And she's always been right in every election in our married life for the last 27 years because she looks at the popular opinion. That's obviously what happens in elections. So you need to know 
in, in, those, in your management, in your developers, and your middle management, all those layers, when you're talking to people to convince them, be aware of these things because it changes how you talk to them. If I'm talking to a persuader, I'm going to point to a big, some big companies that use MarkLogic. I'm going to point to Gartner. And this is a true story. Two weeks ago, um, a month ago now, um, an engineer in our BI team came to me and goes, we just read the Gartner report on data warehouses. And, and MarkLogic showed up in the, in the, in the contender um, or the, um, what's that? Oh, darn it. What's that? In the magic quadrant, and there's the leader's quadrant, and then there's the um, challenger. Thank you, challenger. So they showed, Mark Rogers showed up in the challenger quadrant, and they were impressed. Why? Because this guy was a persuader, and it was Gartner's influential, and they said, wow, if Gartner is saying Mark Logic is a challenger, we ought to look at him. I've been telling them facts for, for eight years. It didn't matter because our entire BI team is hired by people who are persuaders. And our BI guys talk to businesses, and they, they always hire persuaders in that group and on our teams. So 50, 50 BI guys, and they're all persuaders. So they only care about what other people say. It doesn't matter. I tried this forever. Totally failed. Um, I had to make Mark Logic successful at upper management by building apps really fast on it. And, and it was really Stuart Shaline, who's at the conference, he was, used to work for us, and he built apps for our CIO. And our CIO was a controller persuader blend. And so he loved to see apps built in weeks. You know, you can build this complex app in a week, and you go, yeah, that's the one I want. Fast, easy, quick, done. Okay, and then the, so, and what I, but our director of engineering was a stabilizer. So he made me go and debate with the entire engineering organization. We brought MarkLogic in because he wanted the engineers to have consensus on bringing MarkLogic in, which is impossible, but that's what he wanted. So when you talk to analyzers, use the facts. And here's some facts that I like to use. So I like to make sure that the facts align to the dearest principles of, of database and their, the dearest principles to themselves. So an analyzer, the facts are who they are. Their work is who they are. This is part of them. If you argue facts with an analyzer and they don't believe in your facts, I mean, they're arguing from their deepest part of their soul. Right? Their facts are who they are. So you better have your facts right and, and better focus only on the facts and get emotion out of the way and talk quieter and slower and more patient. Um, and it's hard to do in a presentation like this because I'm getting excited again, but that's, that's what you need to do. And so you'll go databases, NoSQL databases scale horizontally. It's a, basically an engine, um, but MarkLogic's much more because it's a true database. And it's typically ideal for startups, but MarkLogic is enterprise ready. So you can see already that MarkLogic can cover wider ground. And few NoSQL engines are ideal for enterprises, but MarkLogic is because it has asset compliance, multi-model, mature features, usable right out of the box. Plug it in, run it, and do your stuff. You don't have to build a database on top of it like Cassandra. And it's exceptional for developer productivity. And, and a lot of developers are analyzers. Um, I think that's, a, that's a, everything I say, that's an overstatement, of course. There's all styles and everything. But I found that a lot of them are because they, they like to sit and think and be by themselves and write lots of code. And so this works really well for developers in a lot of cases. Controllers are often your executives. Again, that's, these are all you know, broad statements. And, but they really like to make sure things happen. And so what I do there is we want to make sure that these are real concrete things that executives care about, like lower cost, faster development, lower infrastructure costs, scales globally, global available, enables data sovereignty. But you know what? These are all facts because you can see I'm an analyzer, so I'm going to put facts down here. What does an executive really want? Action. They want to be able to say, I want to see how fast you can make that database built. Can you get it done in a week? Done. You're hired. Done. Great. Done in a week? Great. Now build another one. I mean, it's just do it. Show it fast. So more than anything that I have here is show, show the reality of how fast you can do it. Um, persuaders, it's really the who. So Aetna does mark logic. Uh, Deutsch does mark logic, right? The big guys and have them talk to a lot of, it goes, drives me crazy. I go to some of these conferences and I was at Oracle World this last time, and they, they have these sessions where they, the CEO brings up all these other major CEOs of other companies, and they do this thing, right? They're all doing, well, we use it, therefore it's good. Now, I'm an analyzer, and I just go, that's stupid, right? <laughs> Give me the facts. Don't tell me who's using it, because you just paid them off, right? So, but they really, persuaders are truly influenced by the leaders. Now, I'm more influenced if you had an, an intellectual person who is a thought leader, um, talking about it, and who actually had hands-on experience, and that influences me more, and that could that could that would persuade me. 
Um, and that's the role I'm playing here. I've done this for eight years. I've hands-on, we have teams doing this. I know it works. Um, so I'm being that kind of persuader right now. But the other thing is if you're dealing with a persuader, they want to be liked by you. So you want to be likable. But we're, it's funny, I watch these conversations where you get an analyzer who's dogged and determined. My facts are right. And they're just like, Arr! and then the persuader's like, can we go have fun now? I want to go play golf. Can we go throw frisbees? Can we do something fun? Can we have a party? I want a party. I want a party. Come on. It's party. And the guy's, I want to talk about facts. You've got to believe me. You know, and I've watched this like, boom. And it doesn't go anywhere. You gotta have the persuaders have to have fun, and you gotta be lighthearted and happy, and then they'll listen to you. So analyzers and persuaders tend to like blow each other up. And if you can imagine now, psychoanalyze me, I'm an analyzer and I'm a persuader. So in my brain, I got both of them going off all the time. It's awesome. Um, how to influence stabilizers? It's easy. Popular opinion. You gotta make sure, but you gotta make sure that you don't ruffle. Um, the feathers or make waves in the organization. Stabilizers care about the, fa the relationships between people. So they don't want, you know, if you bring in, move their cheese, you know, bring in Mark Logic in, moves a lot of people's cheese, <laughs> right? So you gotta be really careful about that and you gotta make sure you get a lot of consensus. That means you have to spend, as a champion of Mark Logic, you're going around all over the place, make sure everybody understands and, and, and you're building connections with people. So if I'm talking to a stabilizer, I wanna take time to talk about their families. Their, you know, this is not manipulation, this is just generally connecting with the person. Right? I'm not saying, let me go about your family so I can go convince you to buy Mark Logic. No, it's about, it's about connecting with the person and they're finding out their true needs and then seeing how Mark Logic can meet their needs because they care about the relationship you're developing. And they want you to be around. Uh, and, and a stabilizer will commit, when they commit to something, it's like committing to it till the death. I learned that the hard way. When I was dating my wife, um, <laughs> true story, <clears throat> we were, I was playing the piano. I'm, I'm, I'm a pianist and I would practice four hours a day. I majored in music and got degrees in music and all that stuff. Anyway, I was practicing the piano and um, in the more, the, after, after a one date, she says, can we meet on Friday? I said, sure, and it was kind of like vague. It wasn't like we have a date going somewhere. And my mind is kind of like, yeah, let's just get together, you know? Well, I'm practicing and I'm into practicing. And like, I get like an analyzer, I'll get deep into something and I'll deep dive and I'm playing one measure for two hours. And so you think that's weird, right? But I did that. So anyway, I practice these really complicated passages and you have to go really slow and gradually speed them up, and memorize them, get them in your finger memory. And so I'm deep into thought in all this and I blow off the time. I'm not thinking, but I'm thinking, you know, I know the time. I mean, it was probably a half hour after we were going to meet, and I noticed, oh, I'm late. Ah, no big deal, because we didn't have a commitment, you know. Man, when I finally met her, it was the end of the world. I broke a commitment. All I said was, we're going to meet on Friday. Yeah, but you were, you know, anyway. It was, I had to learn the hard way that stabilizers care about relationships and commitments. You never, they will die on the sword to follow, to follow through on something. So if you say Mark Logic does something and it doesn't, you better be right, and everybody better agree on it. So again, you'll be really careful. That's why I have a bear picture here, right? So you don't mess with the mama bear. <laughs> so NoSQL right now is, is kind of on the peak of the hype cycle. For us, because we've been doing MarkLogic for eight years, it's gone down through the trough of disillusionment and is now coming back up. So we had, we've had the last four years have been really challenging in our organization. Um, because we, we already went through the hype and now we've gone through like, well, it doesn't do this and it doesn't do that and teams have been disillusioned and, and, and saw other nice little carrots out there, other NoSQL databases like Cassandra or Mongo or whatever the flavor of the day is, right? And they go, I want to do that one. We have tried them all. Reoc, Cassandra, Neo4j, Mongo, um, you name it. Oh, anyway, so we have, we've tried them all and MarkLogic is still here with us. So we're moving really well and keeping on the path of going toward productivity in MarkLogic. Um, but you may be somewhere on this curve. The industry is at the top, so you might be up here at the top. But I've watched the NoSQL Now conference um, used to draw a big group, and now it's really take to the point where they combine it with Enterprise Data World. So now it's not even its own conference anymore. Um, this industry is falling off this cliff, and it's an interesting time for MarkLogic because it's good and it's bad. It's good in that the, the MarkLogic for us had already fallen off the cliff and it's coming back. And it's, it's like the technology went bad. It's the perception of it, the use of it, it's the hype cycle. But the industry, NoSQL's falling off the cliff right now, MarkLogic's coming back. 
I think it's a great opportunity for Mark Logic to say, look, the NoSQL vendors are falling off the cliff. You tried projects, they failed you because they don't have enterprise features or whatever it is. Um, try this Mark Logic thing. It's a great opportunity because Mark Logic is mature and can handle it. Um, the last thing I want to show you is, and I want to open it for questions. I want to show you this. This is my favorite slide. I did this eight, almost eight, yeah, it was eight years ago when I did this slide. I've changed it a little bit since. But this is what I think the power of Mark Logic really is. You can take text, pure text, a story, a narrative, right? And you can load that right into Mark Logic. Mark Logic will actually parse all the words and you can search it. So that's useful all by itself. But then you can also go in and mark up things in Mark Logic and say, oh, this is a person. EF Cod wrote this article about the relational model for of data for large shared data banks. And this is the original article that created the whole relational revolution. Um, and then you can say it was done at the research laboratory in San Jose, California, and published in information and retrieval. Right? You can mark up all this data. Even the data is published June 1970. So think about that. Relational databases were born in June of 1970. So here we are, and we're in the middle of a new revolution, the NoSQL revolution. Now I can take this text and mark it up, and now mark logic, which I really like the phrase mark it up and mark logic because that really is the point of the logic behind marking things up. And so this makes the data, you, you turns the narrative into data. And now we've turned that text into contextual information. We've turned text into information. So Mark Logic automatically does that. Um, and then we can go and create relationships between the data items. That's what semantics does, and those are called semantic relationships. So I can say EF Cod is the author of, that would be the author of, relational model of data for large shared data banks. Why was you just a database, right? Isn't that funny? That word database wasn't even back then. Large shared data banks. Anyway, so Cod was the author of that article. Cod worked for IBM Research Laboratory. Research Laboratory is in San Jose, California. Right? So those are semantic relationships. They're very precise. And then the other kind of relationship in here is structural. This document has is a document. Inside the document are sub-documents or subsections, and subsections within subsections. And the structure changes the meaning too. For example, if I say the title here of the of a whole document really gets applied to each of the subheadings. So this is this relational model applies to this relational model normal form. Relational model normal form applies to the introduction. And you see introduction by itself doesn't mean anything, but because it's a child of relational model and normal form, it has more meaning. And then when I get down into sub subsections, you can see how the, the titles carry through. So the structure of a document has meaning too. So when you put all the meaning, semantic meaning, which is explicit markup connecting things using triples, with not just connecting things, connecting data that you've marked up using triples. And the structural structure of the document combined, you turn contextual information into meaningful knowledge. Because now you've added, you've made the information meaningful explicitly with, with triples by saying EF Cod wrote, the meaning is in the verb wrote, the relationship wrote here or is author of of this article, right? That is meaningful and it's very precise. So Mark Logic can do that. It has semantics, it can mark up the data, and it combines semantics and data with documents. So it, this, this is revolutionary. Now I want to think about this is more than just for text. This works for JSON, which is for data. Right? This, is, this changes everything. I want to think of one last thought. I shared this last year at the conference. When you take a document, is related to another document. You have now transformed the industry from being the old style relational, which you have called invented, from being a table is now can be joined through foreign keys to other tables. I can now explicitly say document is like a row in a table, but it's rich, it's got nested elements, it's a full entity that truly describes a person, a place, or a thing, or a transaction. You don't have to compromise and have me to ones normalized out and other things. You can combine it all together in one rich document. And you can say that document is related to any other document in the database through any other relationship. And you can change those relationships at runtime. You can change the document structures at runtime. You can make document structures complex. You can grow them. You can shrink them. You can, you can add all these envelope patterns and have metadata about them that dynamically changes. This is revolutionary. You can't do that in relational. 
This is the whole new model. And think about relational. Even though you have a COD called it relational model, it's not a relational model. It's a model with foreign keys. Mark Logic can do true relational modeling by saying this document relates in this specific way to that document. That is true relational modeling. And only Mark Logic can do that. You can't do that with any other NoSQL database. Um, you can get close with like Neo4j, which has property graph model. Um, but Mark Logic is true document modeling. So I want to leave you with that. I'm going to open the time up for questions. Thank you for your presentation. A question about some of the other uh, NoSQL databases. You mentioned a few uh, that you'd evaluated, you folks had uh, taken a look at in the past. Do, would you mind sharing if you currently still have instances of those and just, and also more importantly, what the decision time frame, the evaluation time frame were in taking a look at those, the, the cycle of evaluating a NoSQL database, you, you yeah. folks had gone through a few. Yeah, of so my, in fact, my role right now is I'm in charge of all database technology at the church. So I evaluate all, I'm in charge of evaluating all of them. I've been doing this um, job for, for NoSQL specifically for five years. So I've been doing this for five years. This is a pic screenshot of, um, of the whole entire NoSQL and SQL industry and where they fit in. I have evaluated um, the documentation and the high level of every database on this screenshot. But detailed evaluations, we've done Cassandra, Redis, MongoDB, Couchbase, uh, CouchDB, OrientDB, Cloudant, obviously MarkLogic, Neo4j, um, and Solar. On the relational side, we, do, we have Oracle and SQL Server. We've evaluated MySQL, Postgres, um, DB2, and um, not deep evaluations of SAP, but we've, we were impressed with it, it was just too costly. So we've done deep evaluations of Netiza and Vertica, and we have Exadata, Oracle Exadata. So those are, every, but I can talk to all the pros and cons of every database on this page. Um, I stay on top of this and I present at conferences about this um, all over the place. Um, so yeah, I spent five years staying up with this industry. The coolest thing about, you know, people in the industry have this hype around acid and say, well, we don't need acid. It's a joke. It's not a joke. So for example, MongoDB is, gives you the same developer productivity that MarkLogic does in the beginning, because they're both document databases. And you, that's really the core paradigm that gives you the productivity. But then in the end, Mongo doesn't have acid compliance. So when you build the app to try to scale it with lots of concurrent users, you get consistency problems. Trying to write code to compensate for consistency problems is a big deal. It reads rewrites and huge and principal engineers to figure out the problems. And so any, anybody who's tried to do you know any, anything multi-threaded and trying to coordinate threads and make data consistent, think about a database and trying to do that and writing your own database. So MongoDB has a problem later in the development cycle that bites them and destroys all the productivity gains you got in the beginning. With MarkLogic, it's asset compliant. So you get the productivity and you keep the productivity. Um, throughout the whole life cycle. With Cassandra, you're building the, all those tables and it's really slow. You're building an engine first. You're taking an engine, building a database, and then you're writing all those tables and materializing them, um, and that kills your productivity. But the cool thing when you're done with Cassandra is you've built a custom database for your app. It's like a, a database built specifically to accomplish the needs of your app, which is the cool thing about Cassandra, but you're going to spend a fortune doing it, and it's going to take a long time. So. If you're, trying to sell, if you're trying to convince someone not to use Cassandra, your executive who maybe is a controller, to say, well, if you want to spend three years building this, or do you want to build it in six months? Yeah. So Question. What are these numbers? These numbers are popularity numbers. Popularity isn't everything, um, but these are, these, in the industry, if you talk to developers, this is how the developers see it. If you are a, if you are a stabilizer, then literally our organization sees it this way. I've talked to you know, dozens, scores of developers in our organization, and they'll say, yeah, MongoDB is what we want to use because they consider popularity a big deal because it's the fourth most popular database in the world. Um, it's after Oracle and MySQL and SQL Server, and then there's Mongo. And so our developers are constantly coming to me and saying, we got to use Mongo. So I have to use all these techniques. I go say, are you a persuader or a controller or analyzer? I think this in my mind. How, what, how do I approach you? Um, so I, I use the right style. And then I, then I approach them with whatever that style makes sense to talk to them, um, talk them off the cliff on Mongo and say, look, it's, you know, I explain asset compliance. And that one's a tough one. You got to study up on asset compliance. Yeah. 
Sam. So I'll just put a plug in. If anybody wants to see Mike's entire brain dump on, well, not the entire, but a, a, a complete brain dump on these databases, it's recorded on YouTube, and I can give you the link. Yeah, if you YouTube my name and NoSQL and MarkLogic, it'll come up, and you can, you can watch. I, do it, I just finished an eight-hour training at Enterprise Data World on this. Um, and that's too short of a time. We need more like 16 hours so, or 32. So we but can I, do. I do have a question for yeah. you, Mike. Um, can you give us just uh, off the hip estimate of what, like, like this ranks the popularity of these databases. I presume that your developers have the keywords. They want on the resumes. Some of them probably want MarkLogic. Some want Oracle. Do you have a percentage, MarkLogic versus Oracle, Java versus Node.js? And, and is that even relevant? It is relevant. That's an awesome question. De developers are focused on their resumes. And popularity means, where can I get hired next? That's a huge factor that kills us all the time. They want Mongo on their resume. So here's how I deal with it. I wrote it. I created an Excel spreadsheet. I went through MarkLogic has a query by example language, which is almost identical to MongoDB's query language. And I, I just, in my book that I'm writing, the cookbook, I, I use that and I just say, here's, here's function by function. Here's how you would query Mongo. Here's how you query MarkLogic. They're the almost the exact same. There's, only, there's very little difference between those two languages. And then I show them Mongo can do this much querying and MarkLogic can do this much querying. So if you want power or do you just want popularity? Um, and so it doesn't always work. Then I talk about asset compliance with them. Some of them are just so dead set on, on resume and names that they don't care. And so we, the, the majority of our developers resist MarkLogic because they're looking at their resume and they either want Mongo or Cassandra. Some of them are um, absolutely diehards about it. I have one guy who just won't quit talking about Cassandra. It drives me crazy. Um, I can't reason with him or anything. He's just like, we're doing, you should have Cassandra. It's like, oh. So, I, I, so he, he's not an analyzer because facts don't work on him. So, uh, so yeah. I've uh, probably got time for one more. Oh, the, 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 just the part B uh, on the evaluation time cycle that you folks. Uh, so I, I evaluated Mark Logic for um, two months um, before we brought it in. Then we, we brought it and made it enterprise ready in six months. Our cost is about $500,000 is our rough cost for bringing in a new database into our organization and integrating it with infrastructure and monitoring and all of our processes. Um, and then you're going to have an ongoing cost of like two people full time to maintain the database. So in evaluating other ones, I, I, would, I didn't spend two months on each one. I would, depending on the database, and the, I spent most of my time on the Mongo and the Cassandra. Um, those were the two biggest ones that were the biggest competitors to MarkLogic in our group. And I spent most of my time, in this case, we already have a great license agreement with MarkLogic, and so we have an unlimited perpetual license of MarkLogic. So we're really committed there. So I spent most of my time really defending it, um, but I spent a lot of time, I spent probably two weeks on each year reviewing Mongo and Cassandra and Neo4j are the top ones I look at in depth each year. But throughout the year, I'm spending time on all of them, re re reading the documentation, watching the new releases, watching what's new in them. Um, honestly, the, you get the Mongos and the Cassandras are doing a good job becoming enterprise ready. There's the story that MarkLogic used to only be, we used to really could say that. They were the only enterprise ready, no SQL. That's not true anymore. MongoDB has some features MarkLogic doesn't have now as far as enterprise ready. But it's not ACID compliant, right? And that's huge. And our developers, by the way, don't get it. They don't, they have been so, it's like they've been on an island for the last 50 years because they don't know, they, they've been so distant from the, the early pain. I lived through it. I lived through the pain where, where databases weren't ACID compliant and you, and you suffered, your app suffered, right? So I had to compensate. But now they are and it's just normal. They don't even think about it. So they get in Mongo and they think it's going to be as good as Oracle or it could be good as MarkLogic because it's, hey, we don't need ACID. The vendor says I don't need ACID. So why would I need this? Um, and then they, then they learn the hard way. So it's, they're going to be hitting the, that down cycle on the hype into the trough of disillusionment here once they realize, wait a minute, we just got burned. Our project is late. But they have to go through it. A lot of them will have to go through it. Right. Mike, thank you very much. Please join your hands together for Mike. Thank you. Appreciate it.